Thank you for staying with us. You're still watching The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Now, big players behind all theft live in Abuja and Lagos, and that's been said by Dixon, Senator Seriaki Dixon. The PDP Biosa West, former governor of Biosa State, claimed that the major perpetrators of oil theft in, in the Niger Delta are influential individuals residing outside the region. During a visit to Okboroza Wari Southwest local government area Delta State, Dixon asserted that Ijo Utah often wrongly accused of all theft despite lacking the technical skills and resources needed to execute such operations. Dixon emphasized that those orchestrating all theft have significant resources, technical expertise and international connections and are based in cities like Lagos, Abuja and abroad. He pointed out that the Ijo people live in the creeks and rely on waterways and farmlands for their livelihood suffering from the pollution caused by oil theft. Now, joining us to make sense of all of this is Biodun Showomi. He's a public affairs analyst. He's on the phone this morning. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So we're talking about oil theft in Nigeria. Now, this is a widespread, um, you know, that it's something that we've spoken about so many times. And for every time we talk about it, it's still being done because you're hearing of um, people stealing our crude you're hearing of ships on the on the sea and sometimes they'll tell you they burnt it down because it was a stolen shipment but let's talk about oil thefts um you know and how it impacts us nigerians how it impacts our economy as well this oil theft that is so widespread how does it impact us in general yes um the problem of oil oil theft has been with us for a long time yes um it's not just something so sudden um, it's not something, I mean, since the 70s, we've been having this problem. It's always by a cartel, you know, involving uh, even international syndicates uh, specializing in buying the oil. Um, oil theft has also been uh, responsible, partly, you know, for proliferation of arms. For instance, in the case of Nigeria, we've seen how it has posed a threat, you know, to our country. Uh, the entire weapons in the in the Niger Delta were brought in through uh, Ukraine, you know, uh, through oil bunkering and then being paid for, you know, the hands are being paid for through that. So many reports by security agencies have alluded to that, both locally and internationally. So there is no doubt about the fact that it could pose a national security threat to our country. Mm. Again, secondly, it's uh, again responsible also partly you know, for uh, loss of revenue by the country, in the sense that um, all that are meant to be exploited and exported, you know, for the foreign is uh, for, for 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 the dollars which are needed to boost our foreign reserves and for national expenditure purposes, you know, are being stolen by a few individuals, taken out of the country, and uh, just strictly for their own benefit, mm. and that impacts on the volume of oil which we export, you know, on a daily basis. And of course that is not does not go well for our country. And we've all seen how uh, it could affect the national budget one way or the other. So um, it has a major impact apart from um, encouraging youths in crime, if you go to the river Rhine areas, you will understand what I mean. Because a lot of the people involved, you know, in 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 um, theft of oil are not actually based on the ground. These are people who finance it. They are the ones mm -hmm. that will finance the acquisition of a ship. They will be the middle men, you know, mm -hmm. to broker sales with foreign syndicates in international countries. They are the ones involved with security services uh, to compromise them, you know, with a view to be able to, you know, uh, take the oil away safely. But also, we also have the local youths. The local youths are actually the ones operating the rigs. You know, uh, contrary to what Seriake Dixon said, uh, is actually the local youths. There is nobody that will come to your backyard and start exploiting oil mm. without the involvement of the local population. It is strictly not possible. We have also seen the link between um, the whole trade and also private jets. You will remember there is a popular pastor uh, whose jet was. Um, um, was uh, involved, you know, with uh, Elioka in um, arms shipment in uh, South Africa, you know, some years ago. So we have this problem, um, you know, about this um, 
oil theft, what they call, they call it bunkering, actually. Yeah. But government has been doing its best, but they are not doing enough, in my view, because quite often we don't see the big perpetrators, you know, being arrested or being prosecuted. And when they are arrested, after some time, you hear nothing about it again, and the case is dead. Hmm. So I, I know that, you know, the financial losses are hu huge, I want to believe, right? Um, but I'm sure there are also some environmental <coughs> hazards that dispossesses because, I mean, from even what, what I just read, it was talking about pollution for the locals there. Yeah. So this all, this bunkering, you know, that they do, of course, they are probably damaging some of the pipelines and, you know, causing the oil spillage in the river and communities. And so, of course, our aquatic um animals are going to die there's going to be no aquatic life so aside the fact that we're losing money um i'm sure there's also some environmental hazard that this causes as well if i'm right oh yeah you're absolutely correct i mean the environmental hazards uh, posed by uh, oil bunkering has been well documented not only by um, amnesty international also by oxfam a mm. uk-based charity you know, they've actually documented all these issues uh, very, very well. So what we've seen is that it's not only about polluting the environment, mm. it's also a threat to the livelihood of, um, uh, of uh, the local people, uh, the farming community and all that. Uh, farmers are not able to uh, go to their farm either because the land um, is, um, has been damaged by oil uh, slick. And also the same thing, you know, with um, fishermen, they are not able to go and uh, get appropriate uh, fishes, you know, fish in the water simply because of the same problem. They have to go deeper into the ocean with um, ballistic vessels. So these are some of the problems, and no doubt about uh, about it. A lot of it is due to oil pollution um, uh, as a result of uh, bunkering. That does not mean that oil on its own does not even pollute the environment. If you look at gas flaring, that is part of the pollution going on. But that is as a result of illegitimate activity and not as a result of both uh, hmm. So, like we've established here, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. So, like we've established here, right, this is something that has been going on for such a long time. Oil theft is not a conversation that is just being had right now. It's something that's been going no. on for years. We've really spoken about it. So, if we've been advocating, you know, for something like this, what is taking the government so long? Why are they not combating this oil theft? And mind yeah. you, you know, um, Abla spoke about how some of these same people right are you know in corruption like some of these same people they live where we are they are prominent people in our society so why are we not combating oil theft is it that we're trying to save the people who are you know like the syndicates that is a part of this yes um when you look at the issue of um, uh, oil theft and why we're not doing much about it, it's simply because over the years, we have been producing 2.2 million barrels of oil a day. Then suddenly, uh, we now have a different situation. We are producing about 1.3 million, 1.4 million barrels a day. So the issue is becoming more important because it's a threat to our national um, earnings, you know, from oil. So uh, that is why people are beginning to focus more on the impact of bunkering. But when we are producing SX, you know, in excess of two million barrels a day, attentions were was paid to that sector, but not given the same uh, priority, the same prominence as is being done currently. And um, of course, the major issue with um, uh, detection is even when people are arrested. And we have seen, in fact, the I think the last term um, she that was arrested were killed by Ukrainians. Um, we have not seen the end of that case. In some cases, cases get delayed in court. In some cases, there is a behind-the-scenes settlement of those cases. We have not seen the big barons themselves, you know, being thrown into prison, you know, after being processed through the criminal justice system. What we've seen is area display of um, Air Force bombing, 
you know, bunkering facilities, mm -hmm. you know, bunkering facilities, you know, all over that. And in that situation, is the small boys that get affected, the small local boys, you know, that have been bombed, who are operating the rigs. But the real people financing it, benefiting tremendously from it, are far away from those creeks, and they are the people who are not being arrested or prosecuted in any way or the other. Mm. So, of course, they're selling this, um, whatever they steal, they're selling it to certain people. So they have a buyer, right? You still, you have a buyer who comes to buy it. And like you said, Ukrainians was one of them. So how come, you know, we're, we're, we're allowing this? Because if you're going to get a shipment, the, the, the ships are not small. They are not something that is so tiny in the water that you cannot see. And of course, I want to believe there are people who will sign bill of ladings. There are people who will, who will sign for these things. So how, what kind of loopholes do we have in our system whereby people are just going to turn a blind eye to it and we're selling our crude, stealing the crude, then selling it for gains. And we still have international communities or, or people from, from abroad coming to buy it, still aiding the same corruption. So how come we've made our, our, our system so porous that these things can just fly and nobody's talking about it? Yes, um, there are two major issues uh, responsible for that. The first one is by oil companies. Mm. When you see how oil is calculated in Nigeria, the extraction of oil is not calculated from the volume extracted from the ground or from the sea, it's calculated from the storage. So, and the simple excuse of the international oil majors is that um, um, in the course of uh, um, transporting, after exploitation, transporting it to the storage, some get lost due to bunkering or due to one reason or the other. Mm. So therefore, you can only come from the storage. So therefore, it is convenient for people to tap you know, the oil before getting to the storage. If um, all majors are made to account for oil extracted, you know, right from the extraction uh, point rig, rather than from the storage, you realize that a lot to be done on their own part to ensure that um, oil is not lost in the process of being transported to the storage. The second part of it is um, the Nigerian security services, particularly the Nigerian Navy. <coughs> the Nigerian Navy have the appropriate vessels. You know, to police our waters. I know that the only submarine we have, um, the only uh, high class um, ship which we have, uh, we have is uh, NNS Arado, which has gone for refitting. I don't know whether it's back in the country or not. Uh, but notwithstanding that, we have a lot of coastal vessels which are being used to police our waters. It's just like plane. A plane cannot move into a country without, you know, uh, a detection. You know, the radar will pick it up and. Um, the airport control uh, controllers will engage with the plane. Otherwise, you will have the air force intercepting that plane to identify itself. It's the same thing with shipping in Nigeria. Uh, no ship can just enter your port or mm -hmm. enter your country to load one thing or the other. Uh, they have to clearly be given the time when they have to talk, they have to do this, they have to do that. And when they are departing, uh, where are they going to? All that. You know, but what you see is with collusion, conspiracy, you know, by Nigerian security officials, it is possible for ships to move in, you know, and move out uh, without being challenged. And that is one of the major problems. If you remember the issue of the uh, round tripping of oil uh, to claim subsidy, you know, and that was going on simply because of the collusion. Because when you take the oil, you don't discharge the cargo, but you register the oil as arriving in Port or Lagos. The same oil is taken out to neighboring republic, you know, and sold and brought, brought back, you know, as another, you know, uh, cargo. So there are a lot of things wrong mm -hmm. with our security system. And um, I know the government is trying to live up to its um, responsibility. They've tried to rejiggle these uh, security services. And uh, one can only hope that with the new leadership there now in the last one year, maybe we will be lucky to make... Um, substantial progress in dealing with the issue of bunkering and also cracking down on those who are actually financing it. They are the big barons mm. who are currently not being arrested. So cracking down on these people who are financing it, 
uh, I mean, they're the main actors in this. How come we've not, you know, allowed, we've not put them into the justice system or make them face the justice system, make them dance to the tune? How come there are no consequences? Why is nobody arresting anyone? Why? Because if it's gone on for so long, you cannot tell me that you don't know certain people who are the players um, when it comes to all theft and bunkering. So how come we're letting them go? And of course, when you let them go, more people are going to come in and think it's okay to do that. So why is the federal government, knowing that this is one of our major sources of revenue, why are we not doing anything to be able to save it? To be able to ensure that we're making the most out of what we have, but then allowing other people to come in here, steal it, and sell it. Meanwhile, we, we're left with nothing. Yeah, these are very powerful people. Uh, don't forget our political system is very, very corrupt. Mm. Um, we have a very corrupt civil service also. So that permits, you know, through customs and virtually every aspect of um, um, regulation and control, of um, goods and uh, in the country. Now, the major problem we have is um, in the past, I don't think, even currently, I don't think uh, many people are so patriotic. Uh, we mm -hmm. don't see ourselves as belonging to one country, and this country is ours. Um, some people prefer to operate, you know, just minded by selfish uh, consideration, enlightened self interest rather than. Uh, thinking about the national interest. So we have a major problem, which is one of the thing, reasons why I keep asking myself, what is the National Orientation Agency doing? Uh, because a lot can be done, you know, in terms of orientating our people. We are not doing that. So people tend to see uh, their own selfish interest alone without balancing it with the national interest. Now, it's not that in the past some people have not been arrested. Of course it has happened. But what has happened to those cases? You know, quietly these cases have uh, uh, been resolved you know, without being processed through the criminal justice system. And that is the major problem. There is no deterrent, you know, because uh, the only way to deter crime is to make sure that crime does not pay. You can be tough on crime, but you also have to be tough on the process of crime. Those who are creating the problem, those who are causing this problem, are those who are financing. It's not a thing that you can finance with 100 million or 200 million. No. You know, you're talking of they spend billions to finance uh, this industry. And knowing that it is extremely difficult, given the nature of uh, um, oil business, that apart from those on contract, there is what they call international spot market, that is, ships are on the sea with the oil and a potential buyer will just come and buy it. So it's so difficult to label, you know, those um, um, oil uh, because you can't tell the difference, except you know the ship response. And that primarily should be the problem of uh, Navy and NIMASA. So there are two major government agencies that we need to look at what they are doing and how to make them more efficient uh, in terms of uh, what they do. Otherwise, um, uh, we cannot stop this problem. And the criminal justice is also very important. Why is it that people are not being tried? Yes. Why is it that we are not taking down those behind these uh, business? After all, we have the state security service. So what are they doing about it? Because it's a major threat you know, to our country. So there are a lot of issues, and these are issues you know, that fall within the purview of Mr. President. And one can only hope with time, uh, government will have uh, create enough time or focus more attention on this sector. Mm. So, I mean, if government needs to focus more attention on it, of course they need to, right? So what are some solutions, you know, what are some um, technology, some innovative measures that we can put in place to ensure that we're, we're, we're just combating it right there? So from the local communities who are the um, young stars breaking the pipelines, doing the bunkering, to the people who are financing it, to the people who are selling it, to the people who are coming to buy it as well. So what are some innovative measures that we can put in place to be able to combat all theft forever in Nigeria? In a way, it's a bit easier because all ships on the sea are easily tracked. Mm. You know, there is an international organization responsible. They can tell you where every ship is at every point in time. Now, in relation to our own territorial um, uh, our territories, that's the job of the Nigerian Navy. In the first instance, we need to re -keep the Nigerian Navy before making more you know, demands on them. Like I mentioned, the case of NNS Saradu is the 
it was the only one. I think we acquired it in the 80s. I can't remember whether 1980 or 82, you know, that successfully sailed through uh, the, uh, what, what do you call it, to, to, to Brazil. And since then, we have not acquired the second one. It's remained a flagship undergoing refitting. So we now need to look at coastal vessels. How do we keep the Nigerian Navy with North Coastal vessels? How do we ensure a data, a radar coverage, you know, of our sea in a way that we are able to identify ships and then ensure that ships that are involved in illegal activities or have no explanation from being within our territorial waters, you know, are apprehended, intercepted and apprehended by the Nigerian Navy. We need to improve their capacity. Currently, their capacity is not as good as what it should be, you know, for, for a country with uh, as high as the, the several kilometers of uh, thousands of kilometers of uh, uh, water covering. But the most important thing at the end of this is not just about combing the youths, you know, the cliques. Uh, we need to remember that the only way to stop crime is to make sure that crime does not pay. And the only way to make sure that crime does not pay is to process people through the criminal justice system after diligent, you know, thorough uh, investigation and diligent prosecution. And when they are convicted, we should ensure that they spend the time uh, stipulated, you know, by uh, the judge. Otherwise, if we continue with this attitude of turning a blind eye, if powerful people are involved, we will never solve the problem. The bottom line is we can bomb as many uh, oil uh, bunkering sites as you want. Uh, they can always go to another pipeline and open another spot. You know, and then continue that um, activity. Again, inland, we also need to look at tracking down all the uh, trailers, you know, the tankers loading oil, you know, from where. Because if we don't track them down, what you see is that oil that are being, you know, we know Arepo and some other areas, vulnerable area around Chakamu and also in the Niger Delta area, you know, where these oil are being bunkered. You would not be able to stop it because it's not, they're not only going on the ship, they're also being using tankers to smuggle them out of the country or to sell them, you know, to uh, petrol stations within the country. So a lot of work needs to be done by the Nigerian uh, NSC, this is Civil Defense Force, the Nigerian police, uh, the state security service, you know, and then the federal government needs to equip the Nigerian Navy adequately. Or vision for a future in Nigeria whereby, you know, oil theft is significantly reduced because I'm sure that's what everybody would want, especially when we know that that is our major source of revenue. So what is your vision as we close this? Well, my vision is um, a country where whether it's oil crime or any form of economic crime is dealt with seriously. Yes. Um, because when you look at it, it's only, we don't look at the impact of economic crimes in the destruction of people's lives, in, uh, in privatization of our people. What we look at is only the physical crime, you know, uh, committed crimes of violence. But the worst violence is uh, economic crimes. And oil bunkering is one of the major economic crimes in the country. And it's time we need to ensure that those involved in it are prosecuted so that we can have a more reliable country. We can bring up youths, you know, believing in the values of hard work pay and not crime. Uh, yeah. Currently, what we are doing is we are, we, are, we are encouraging a situation where we are not even uh, being a, a good model you know, for the youths. And then also government agencies such as National Orientation Agency are not really living up to expectations. Mm. That's fantastic. Uh, you, you're so right when you talk about um, we, st we need to stop glorifying crime. We need to really let people know that you can, you can be a legitimate business owner, you can be a legitimate worker, and you will still be successful. So having to be corrupt, Absolutely. having to do um, criminal activities is just a no-go area. And, you know, we, we, we need this money in Nigeria. We need our economy th to thrive. So it's important that we stop oil theft and the federal government does everything they can in their powers to combat it. Biodun, we want to say thank you for coming. It was lovely having a conversation with you on this. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah. 
All right, so we're speaking with Biodun Showomi. He's a public affairs analyst, and we're just talking about um, oil theft in Nigeria and how um, Dixon has said so many of these people, they live in Lagos, Abuja, and in prominent places. They are also in prominent offices. We hope that this will be combated in Nigeria. Now, up next, well, we'll be talking about the fact that Serap has demanded that the CBN governor, well, accounts for missing 100 billion Naira debt notes. Please stay with us.